it was time for me to retire. And I did. And I thought I would do all of those things that retired people do. <laughs> travel, go to the book clubs, do what, you know, and then I realized that people were just kind of writing you off. And I think that's true for a lot of people who retire. It feel like there is this perception that if you have retired, then you are done. I'm resisting the fact that I'm being underestimated. I'm resisting the fact that I'm feeling overlooked, that I'm feeling invisible. Hello, you are listening to the Late Bloomer Living Podcast, where we are reimagining and redefining what it means to be in midlife, where we are gathering energy, momentum, and excitement for our next chapter via candid conversations with other midlifers about their own pivots, pitfalls, and triumphs. I'm Yvonne Marchese, your host, and I'm so happy you're here. Hello, my friend. You know... I hear a lot of older women say that they feel invisible now that they're older. And that can feel really crappy. When it comes to the workplace, you might be passed over for promotions because you are no longer seen to be a mover and shaker. Or you might not be invited to social gatherings after work. And not because no one likes you. They simply don't think to invite you. People tend to gather with people like themselves, people of their own age. But it can feel like a personal slight, even if you don't really want to go. <laughs> and if you're retired, forget it. Especially in America, it seems we are valued for what we do for work. So when you're no longer working, you're automatically a has-been. I would like to point out, though, that invisibility is a two-sided coin. In fact, it does have its advantages. Personally, I think it's nice to walk down the street without the cat calls that used to be a regular thing in my youth. More importantly you can sometimes fly under the radar and be more effective in creating change because no one sees you coming. (laughs) It doesn't change the fact, though, that it can be frustrating and hurtful to be underestimated and undervalued, especially if you take it to heart. And when you don't see yourself represented in advertising or movies in an empowering way, you might begin to buy into the idea that your time to shine is over. Just give up and go home, old lady. Well, my guest today is not going quietly. At 74 years old, Carolyn Doling has become a fashion model, a writer, a speaker, a kickboxer, and a cyclist. I am thrilled to have her here today, and I can't wait for you to hear her story because before she started modeling, she didn't even like to have her picture taken. She had a long corporate career, raised her kids, and in her last job, she worked in fundraising for philanthropic organizations. Modeling wasn't even on her radar until it was. She's a great example of of someone who believes it's never too late to explore your passions. Okay, without further ado, here's Carolyn Doling. Let's go. Thank you so much for being with me, Carolyn. I appreciate it. I appreciate your asking me. It's always good to have a platform for the message. Yes, yes. Okay, so since you brought it up, Can you tell me what your message is? Let's put it out there. Uh, Yeah, my message from the beginning has been that women my age should not be undervalued and underestimated. My experience when I first retired was that people had lower expectations of what I could accomplish. And so what I'm finding is that being a model is a wonderful platform for encouraging other women, but also encouraging all of us to reassess what we think of aging older. Mm. You're speaking my language, Carolyn. (laughs) I love it. I love it. Now, so you're modeling and that 
is something that was not part of your life until you turned 70. Is that right? That's correct. Yeah. Most of my life, I worked in corporate America in some form or fashion, you know, the large companies, AT&T, Bank of America. And then the most recent job, the job from which I retired was a job in philanthropy, uh, where I was consulting with individuals who wanted to be more strategic about their giving. It was a fabulous job and very rewarding, but it was time for me to retire. And I did, and I thought I would do all of those things that retired people do, (laughs) travel, go to the book clubs, do what, you know, and then I realized that people were just kind of writing you off. And I think that's true for a lot of people who retire. It feel like there is this perception that if you have retired, then you are done. That's real. That is a real thing, isn't it? Absolutely. I can't, I mean, I can't speak to it from personal experience, but I will embarrassingly admit to infantile, and I, I don't know if I can get the right word, infantizing, infantilizing older people. Um, when, especially when I was younger, I used to think, okay, midlife is like this awkward time where you're not young anymore, but you're getting older. And it's kind of like, you know, those awkward teenage years kind of when I was as a younger person, I was looking at middle age, like with a lot of fear and trepidation, by the way, and aging in general scared me. Sure. You know, and uh, I was looking at it going, oh, middle age is going to be just awkward, you know, but but kind of in a weird way, looking forward to being older because I felt like older people were cute. And you know what? I'm like, and I think that, you know, we tend to do that to older people and I'm ashamed now. Oh. I'm ashamed of that. And because I'm thinking about when, you know, I'm 54 20 years from now, 30 years from now, I don't want anybody treating me like a child. I've lived a whole darn life by then. Yeah, by, by then you're wise and, you know, with good fortune and good exercise and the right diet and the like, you're still physically capable to do so many things. Uh, no, I definitely share that uh, as a real experience. I mean, I'm often called sweetie. Or isn't she cute? And these are terms that are reserved for three-year-olds or four-year-olds. And so you're absolutely right. There is that shift that other people feel that all of a sudden you have to be treated and spoken to in a certain way. And don't get me wrong. I really appreciate being given my seat when I'm on the subway. or, um, And yet it's... Yeah, it's not always necessary. Sometimes I just want to walk. And I do appreciate your being sweet to me, but I prefer you not call me sweetie. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And I will tell you, I love your gray hair. I'm working on it. It's, it's <laughs> I'm letting it come in. And right now I'm salt and pepper and I'm really looking forward to a full head of white hair. I just want that white hair. You know, <laughs> my, my dad had it all. He went gray really early and I was like, I hope I get gray early. But um, a friend of mine just made the transition, stopped dying and went ahead and went gray. And she is a gorgeous woman, gorgeous. And all of a sudden, she was treated completely differently, like walking through, she's in good shape. Right. And 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 not in need of any kind of physical assistance, but she's walking through the airport and gets stopped. I think she said three times by the people driving the carts offering her a ride. And she she was so angered by it, you know. <laughs> it's like, what? I don't need a ride. I just not have yet. gray hair. <laughs> No, I mean, it's, um, and like I said, I really appreciate it. And we should applaud people who are empathetic and want to assist. And yet I think it is definitely a function of the society and the perception of what it means to be older. And um, 
Yeah, so I'm on a mission to try to not totally change that, but give people another view of what, now I'm 76, what a 76-year-old can do. And as I say jokingly to my friends, you know, in most games, the higher the score, the better it is that you win the game, right? If you got a high score, why not in life? You know, the older you are, you win the game. Yeah. <laughs> so let's so, go back and how and tell me how you even started modeling. What? How did? How did that even happen? Well, you know, like I said, I was really feeling underestimated. And I was speaking with everyone I could about it, my friends. And I was one day in a boutique, a local boutique uh, called McMullen in Oakland, California, where I live. And I was, she was having an afternoon of um, glamour for her clients. And they were interviewing people to ask them what their goals were. And so I went on a rant about how it was important to me that um, women who were my age and younger, over 50, uh, realized their power and that they would incorporate more swagger and sass in their life or something like that, I said, using fashion as a tool to become more visible. And she says, oh, that's such a great idea. Why don't you come in next week and do some photos for her social media? I did, and the it's a really high-end boutique, and so the other designers really thought it was nice, not just cute, but nice that she was featuring someone of my age, and they so it was a social media progression from there. The designers enjoyed it, their clients enjoyed it, and from there I got kept getting referrals for social media. And so now I have an agent in New York and I have an agent in San Francisco and I get called for commercial jobs, fashion jobs. And again, like I said, it's my platform to try to influence the perception of women, but also the people who are making the decisions about who to use in these commercials, who to use in their on their runway. Often when I go to auditions, the panel of people making the decision are 30 year olds <laughs> and they have not necessarily bought into the fact that a 76 year old should be <laughs> on runway. Mm -hmm. But when I leave, I hope that I have uh, encouraged them to rethink who it is and why they're using who they're using and why not change. So little by little, you know, changing the perception. And I'm encouraged every day by people who are even 30 years old who say, wow, I'm so inspired. This is me. I want to be you when I'm your age. So, yes. so it's working. It's working, Yvonne. <laughs> it is. I, I do. I think, I think it's becoming, you know, ageism is the last acceptable ism, they say, you know, we're, we're trying to tackle some of the rest of it. You know, at least we're aware of it. Right. But I think that ageism is something that is so ingrained that we don't even know when we're doing it. We don't even know when we're doing it to almost more importantly to ourselves, you know, and when that 30 year old doesn't see the value in having an older person as a model they're being ageist against themselves because eventually they're going to be there. <laughs> right? Hopefully, hopefully, that's hopefully, correct. right. No, hopefully that is I, correct. <clears throat> I love that you used the word swagger, by the way, that just <laughs> really, uh, it, it, I mean, it went right down my spine, like, like a shiver, like, yes, swagger. I love that idea <laughs> of, of aging with swagger. Right. And, you know, you mentioned that we do it to ourselves and I often hear comments from um, individuals who say things like, well, this technology is too much for me. I have to get a you know teenager to help me with the technology. Or we resort to wearing really dark clothing. We resort to wearing black and just kind of blending in because, mm. I don't know, because we don't want to be noticed or it's definitely a trend that I see. 
Um, and I just suggest just to flip that script and just wear the bold red dress. Yeah. Wear the hot pink pants. Yes. Yes. You know, and be and that, damned if it's age appropriate, right? <laughs> age I mean, appropriate is just such a ridiculous term. It so is. Have you always been um, attracted to fashion? Has that always been something that you like? Because I think you told me the, fir the first time we spoke, you told me you did not like to have your photo taken. But what I but what I don't know is whether or not fashion has always been a part of how you express yourself. Yes, that has definitely been the case. I mean, my style has transitioned over the many years. I mean, early when I was, uh, you know, teenager, that was really important. Growing up, as I mentioned earlier, I grew up in North Carolina, and it was during, um, you know, civil rights unrest. What you wore and how you dressed was such a major part of uh, your intentions and how you want it to be viewed. Mm. So like, for example, if you look at any of those marches, you know, Martin Luther King and people crossing bridges, the women were always in dresses, mm -hmm. the men in the men in suits and ties. Dressed well, Dr dressed, dressed for church, really, dressed, right? Dressed. Um, and again, that was intentional. It's like um, a way to gain assimilation, mm -hmm. a way to gain the respect for what their message was. And so, yeah, it was important. But then I went through transitions where it was, you know, you had kids and it wasn't such a big deal. And you couldn't really <laughs> be too flashy. And I don't mean flashy in the sense that, that I should be flashy now. <clears throat> it's just that, you know, it's just a lot more conservative dress. So if you had kids who might you know, spit up on you in the morning on the way to school. You can mm -hmm. really have on the silk dress. There's a lot of practicality you know, that goes into mom dressing. Right. That's for sure. Exactly. <laughs> so, so yeah, there's been this transition. And I would say being from that, in that era, there was a lot of emphasis on classic style. Um, and so I still embrace that today, uh, classic style, but now with kind of a twist and a lot more, uh, color in it you I think I remember you telling me you started to embrace color more right as part of this this journey that you're on is that true absolutely yeah. um because at the time that I was feeling invisible I thought I have control over how people perceive me even if I'm just going to the grocery store so just think about what it is. I mean, not you don't always want to have those social interactions that wearing something colorful will give you. But when you do, then you have the power to make that change. So wearing something colorful is a way that I do express myself. Yeah. As a, as a, as a person, you could, nobody can see me right now, but I am in my uh, dark gray and my black. There's a purpose for that because I'm a photographer. And so I was, I was at a photo shoot this morning and I don't want to throw color onto, you know, I was doing a newborn session. I don't want the color to reflect off the baby's skin, you know, but I will say I rely on my black color palette very often even when I'm not, <laughs> you know, doing photography. And I'm, I have recently started thinking about incorporating more color, like very purposefully. Um, I started to realize that I actually look really good in royal blue and I actually look mm. really good in emerald green and they make me feel good, you know, putting on that color. And I, we went to a, uh, recently went to a, uh, a New York street fair. Uh, this yes. summer when a friend was visiting and I found this crazy jumpsuit that's like a mustard yellow and it has like it's like this baggy thing and it's got these uh you know the MC hammer pants where it's got the really really yes, really low har crotch harem pants I think yes harem yeah. pants thank you and so that's it and I was like oh I don't know if I can carry that but you know what I got it and I ended up, I've worn it once, went to a concert and I was like, I'm 
putting on my sassy little jumpsuit. <laughs> my God. And, you know, I felt, and I had on, a, I got myself this kicking pair of white boots that are ankle boots that are like, like a combat boot kind of thing. And I had that and I just felt very sassy. I felt good. And I'm like, you know, I know this is a quirky outfit and it's, it's kind of goes back to what I was doing back in college. And my parents used to tease me because I was in theater and they'd be like, Oh, you have another costume on. And I, as I, you know, I, I took that to heart after a while and I started to dress to fit in more, you know? And as you said, being a mom, that, that was like, okay, let's get practical here. Jeans and a t-shirt, yeah. you know, let's get through the day here. This is the reality, <laughs> right? But now that I'm getting older, I don't have to worry about spit up. I'm looking to, to have a little fun with this and stand out and not be invisible. You know, you're totally inspiring me. <laughs> well, good. And I, you know, I encourage other people um, to use that power. It's it's subtle and yet very, very powerful. How do you want to be perceived today? And I found, you know, during that two years or so when we were, you know, we were isolated and, um, you know, gradually you could go out or you could, you know, go for a walk or whatever, that was a tool that I used very frequently that, you know, to just kind of lift my spirit and lift other people's spirits. Because just as you say, when you wear that hot mustard um, jumpsuit, it makes you feel good and sassy. Other people look at it and think, you know, wow, I should be doing, or why don't I ever, you know, so you're also influencing others' attitudes in a positive way. And I, and also encouraging people to actually chat with you. You know, it encourages people to have a conversation with you. Yeah. So as people who are retired, even though I, I'm reluctant to use that word, I like to think of it as like being rebooted or reinventing yourself. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> if you're feeling that you don't have enough social interactions, that's a very simple tool you can use is to wear something that is stunning or using your clothing as a vehicle for um, encouraging social engagement. Mm, I love that idea. So how remind me again, how old are you now? Did you say 70? Yeah, I just turned 76 in 76. October. So it's been six years you've been on this path. What have, What is the difference that you feel within yourself now between yourself at 69 before you started the modeling do mm -hmm. you feel like you're more visible do you feel like you're are people treating you differently do you do you feel like yes uh and yes and no i i personally i definitely feel more powerful in the sense that I have, uh, I feel like I'm in more control because I realize I have some tools that I can use. I mean, I was doing kickboxing. I do a lot of exercise and I just feel like it's a new me in that respect. Um, but I still, like I said, on the very subway trains or whatever, you still get comments that people react to the gray hair more than anything else. But by and large, I feel like I'm enjoying life a lot more. I feel like I'm uh, using tools I never used before. And it is a way that I have totally reinvented myself at this age. And that six years, I mean, that first couple of years was really just kind of flailing around and talking to other people and the modeling has really just been, uh, well, I say the last three, three and a half years. And then there was that hiatus where we really weren't able to do much. Mm. So, but when I signed with an agent last year in September, that has made all the difference because now I have other, you know, I have an agent who's out there speaking for me and encouraging other that, clients. That does make a huge difference huge, to huge, have huge. somebody who's in your corner. So congratulations on 
getting the agent. And that puts you into the next level of being able to get your message out, right? That That's like next step. Yes. And luckily for me, the agency is one that is on a mission to have non-traditional models. So they're... Um, you know, they're looking for people with freckles, you know, people who have prosthetics and, you know, just trying to encourage clients to use models that reflect the population. And uh, I would say, by definition, a model should be a replica of the real thing. And the real mm-hmm. thing, most of us are not, you know, five foot 10 and a side zero zero with, you know, flowing hair. Um, most of us, I mean, the average person is like five foot four, wears a size 14. <laughs> and, you know, and we have never the thought about that. The model is a representation of the real thing. It should be. It should be. Oh my it gosh, you be. just blew my mind with that statement. <laughs> well, it should be. You know, and w- w- how often do you see, just in your daily activities, someone who is that model, the traditional model, mm. the yeah. exceptionally tall, the exceptionally thin, the exceptionally, and yet we, as five foot four, size fourteens, have buying power in the trillions of dollars. And Mm -hmm. so, so I think that message is becoming uh, more prevalent to the potential clients. And so we are seeing kind of a shift, certainly in terms of size, certainly in terms of height. And like you said, ageism, I think, is the last vestige of that. (laughs) We don't see quite that, especially not in fashion. We see it more in commercial. So, you know, like I've done commercials for pharmaceutical companies, for insurance companies. But when you go to Vogue magazine or any of the high fashion uh, designers, you don't see. You might see age represented but it's say a model who was a model before she turned 50. Mm -hmm. And now, you know, they're making a big deal that we've got this older woman, but she's Mm -hmm. really an older, she's an older five foot 10 size zero zero. Exactly. Uh, (laughs) (laughs) Or it's someone who was an actress, you know, we've seen Helen Mirren. So that at that level, it's slowly being chipped away, but we have a long way to go. And yet the population is getting older every single day. So I foresee that that'll, that the whole thing will change, you know? Yeah. Not the whole thing will change, but I think that people will be more uh, accepting of 50, 60, 70 year olds on runway. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And, and elsewhere as and well. Elsewhere. You know, you, when you mentioned that you're doing kickboxing, uh, when did you start kickboxing? Is it something that you had done before or is it something you picked up as a new activity? You no, know, it's a new activity. I, I love that answer. I just, I just want to say <laughs> that was the answer I was hoping for. And I love that answer. So tell me how it came about. <laughs> well, w- once I left that last job, I had more time to be in the gym. Mm-hmm. So I was doing body k- conditioning and various, you know, Zumba classes, various classes. And there was a kickboxing class, which all of the ladies my age or slightly younger were totally avoiding. You know, I was very interested in what was going on in that kickboxing class. And you go, oh, don't try that because that's just for the young younger, energetic people. And that teacher is quite, I mean, she's doing like boot camp. (laughs) So they're afraid I think that I'm going to break something. I don't know. So I said, well, I'm going to try it. So I just go in and I went on the back row and it was not bad. I mean, it was a typical exercise and you were just boxing. It was like, just, um, we didn't, we weren't using bags. So it was just like free, kicking and 
you know, the teacher was very welcoming and, you know, those trepidations that the other women had were totally melted away. And so I did that for, I don't know, maybe a year or two. So this is like when I was 72, 73. And um, then the pandemic happened and we couldn't go to class. Mm -hmm. And so I was having to do it online. And then after things were lifted, I found a um, kickboxing studio. And so that was maybe a year and a half, a year ago. Um, and so that's the story. It's just like, it was kind of on a dare that I did it to begin with because the other lady said, you should not do that. And that was probably what I needed to hear was you should not, <laughs> you should not do that. And so I did, it worked out well. I enjoyed it. It was another form of exercise that has been really quite, um, it's good for me in so many ways. I mean, it's like, actually, I've used it as a tool whenever I go to auditions and I tell people I'm a kickboxer. Woo, that's a very interesting and exciting thing yes. to do. So doing yes. something different like that has been very, very rewarding in a way that it's allowed me to enter doors that I potentially would not have been able to. Yeah. Do you, so I have a question for you. Since you started the kickboxing at 72, you had started the modeling at 70. So two years, um, you, you'd been doing some of the modeling. Do you feel like you opened a door for yourself because you decided to start dressing with color and then that, that morphed into, Hey, let's do some modeling. And then do, do you feel like those are related at all? Or do you think you might have started the, the kickboxing no matter what? I think they are related in the sense that um, I was addressing this feeling of um, res resistance. I'm resisting the fact that I'm being underestimated. I'm resisting the fact that I'm feeling overlooked that I'm feeling invisible. Mm -hmm. And so I think they're related in that sense. Um, and yeah, the, the, the dare of, and the kickboxing, well, let me just say this, and, and, and each one kind of reinforces the other. So I'm encouraged all the time by people who, are amazed that I'm doing kickboxing. So that just encourages me to do it more. I am encouraged by the messages I get from women who say they're so impressed to see me doing what I'm doing. And so they're looking around at trying to uh, reestablish themselves. They're at a point of retirement or younger and they're wondering, what's my next phase of life? What is my next, what is my next journey? And how do I get there? And they look at me and they're encouraged and then they respond. So it's a constant reinforcement of ideas. It's a constant reinforcement of encouragement for them and for me. And so it's intertwined in a way that, um, that really works for me. Yeah. Does it, does it, give you I wonder if um if the if what you're doing with your modeling and your kickboxing does has it given you additional confidence to keep going to try to, do you look at something and go maybe you know that six or seven years ago you would have written off and now maybe you're like I should try it <laughs> Well, it definitely it it definitely encourages me to do more, more of the same. Mm -hmm. And I think you're right, like looking around to see what else, what am I missing? <laughs> are that there are some other things I could be doing. So I think I mentioned to you that I do more writing now. And um, you know, I've had a couple of articles like AARP is very interested and encouraging me to write the book of my experience of, you know, 
reinventing myself and becoming a model at a late age. Yes. Um, that would be a fantastic book. A book. Um, and also, you know, early on, again, growing up in the South, we all like had music lessons. So I play a little piano. So, you know, maybe you should be doing some piano recitals or, yeah, you're right. I think that because this is working and it's, I'm still also very interested in being the first 76 year old to walk runway who was not a model before. So that, so that's an aspiration. So yeah, I am thinking of other things that um, now that I'm feeling this kind of control, more better control over my own life, uh, that I could be doing even more things. What is my next phase? I I do feel like one thing leads to another, you know, um, for me, starting the podcast, it has led to me finding a bunch of other things like, oh, I was, I used to be afraid of public speaking. And now I want to go get on stages now and spread my message from stages speaking. And that even though I was a performer before, I used to be very terrified of public speaking speaking my own truth, speaking from my heart, speaking about something that mattered to me, you know, whereas if I had a script and rehearsals and a story to be in the middle of, that was fine, you know, and this has like opened me up to be like, no, I have this message and I got to get out of my own way and get the message out. Yes. And I think it's important to have that passion initially for whatever the thing is that you are Uh, that you want to accomplish, Uh, having that passion and then being persistent has been my, is I think what has led to my success. I mean, every day I must do something to move it forward. And when I see a positive message that encourages me, I can't disappoint the people who are in, who are aspiring to do what I do. I cannot disappoint them. Uh, so passion and persistence, I think, are the the two keys. When I first started, I was um, there was that episode with the boutique, but then I got kind of the bug that I wanted to do this more. So one of my daughters friends was an aspiring photographer and I asked her to come we were in New York and we would go into some iconic locations for shoots and I don't know I was styling myself just doing it from the but I was passionate because I really wanted people to see that this was possible and so she came as an amateur photographer and was taking photos of me and then she sent them to me and then I put them on Instagram and she was so sweet. She's like this young 28-year-old girl. Um, she said at the end of the session, she said, you know, you can do this. You just have to be persistent. It won't be easy. People will not necessarily just accept what you're saying with open arms, but it's possible and you just have to be persistent. And I just thought from this young mind, that was such, that was such good advice. And so persistence means yes, every single day I must do something to move this forward. And people ask me all the time, well, how do I get started if I want to do something different? Well, I think it's important that you Take time to understand what it is. Just talk to people, you know. Maybe you wanted to be a stand-up comedian or maybe you'd like to try it. Well, you have to claim that. You have to say, well, this is what I want to do. Mm -hmm. And then when you claim it, you just need to, if you continue to tell people it's what I want to do, people are so supportive. They want to help you. And once you get that network of people going, and you're persistent and passionate about it, ultimately something will happen. But it's so easy to stand back and say, is it possible? Well, like she said to me, it's possible. It's possible. I love that. Just 
yeah, just have to claim it. The, I love the idea of having to claim it because that is a hundred percent spot on. If if you don't, if you're not willing to claim it, where are you? And yes, people are so willing to help. People get excited. It's, I mean, it's inspiring to see somebody doing what they want to do. And people are going to be there to help you on your mission. I love that. Absolutely. It, I I think I'm 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 looking at the time. I can't believe it's gone so fast. I but I think that is a perfect place to end this. Um, thank you. Is is there anything coming up that you're excited about? Well, I'm going to throw my hat in the ring again for New York Fashion Week, which is coming up in January. Fashion Week for 2023. Uh-huh. Um, so this past September, I was there and doing audition casting calls. Um, and I got actually had an opportunity to participate in Vogue World, which was uh, not as a runway model. <laughs> you know, that was, I mean, they, well, as you might imagine, Vogue World, uh, flies the top models in from all over the, the world. Um, but I got to be a participant and Vogue, Vogue dressed me in this wonderful outfit of cashmere and Birkin bag. And, you know, I got to be a part of the street scene. Wow. So I have that. So now my agent is, um, you know, looking for places to place me for runway. And so, you know, so I'm in the process of practicing my walk, sending in tape of my walk. I'll be in New York early January, uh, practicing, getting coaching. It's amazing. <laughs> getting coaching. Wow. And um, then doing casting calls, going to various designers to demonstrate my walk to see if, in fact, I can get a, you know, a fashion designer that's well known to allow me to do runway at that's the so ripe old age of 76. I love it. And I had no idea that there were auditions and that you, it makes sense that you have to practice your walk, that you, 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 you Wow, you just completely blew my mind. I I had no I, I of course, right? And and I wish you good luck. I would love to know if that ends up happening for you this year. <laughs> if not, maybe next year, but it's tremendously exciting. Well, thank you so much for being with us today. People can find you at carolindoling.com, is that right? That is my uh website. Uh -huh. And then uh, my Instagram is just my name reversed. It's D-O-E-L-L-I-N-G, Carolyn. Perfect. Dolan, Carolyn. So, yeah. And I'll have that in show notes for people so that they right. can go and find you as well. Right. It's it, it's an inspiring feed filled with color. Loved. I mean, that's how I found you. I, I you know, I, I have started kind of looking at this idea of, of not being invisible through, through fashion, through clothes as we get older. And, and I guess Instagram knew that, you know, they <laughs> Instagram knew what to send me. And so suddenly there you were in front of me on my feed. And I was like, instant follow, like just so inspired. It immediately went and looked at your website from there, got even more inspired. And, and here we are talking and I'm just, thrilled and would love to stay in touch with you. Thank you. I, so I would much. like that very much. And I really appreciate what you're doing uh, because yeah, I mean, this, this concept, this starts much earlier than when you're 70, you know, this fear of aging. And so what you're doing is really very special. It just for women to realize that uh, it does not have to be this way. It doesn't have to be that people are treating you differently. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So thank you, Yvonne. Thank you very much. You got me all teared up. I appreciate it. <laughs> well, there you have it. I have a question for you. Are you feeling invisible? If so, 
are you embracing the upside of that by gleefully doing what you want while no one notices? Or do you feel left behind? Do you feel like there's no point in speaking up because no one will ever hear you anyway? Or maybe it's a little bit of both? Are you dressing to be invisible? I love that Carolyn wears brighter colors and uses fashion as a way to connect socially. How cool is that? I'm going to play with adding more color and more sass to my clothing choices. I mean, why not? You only live once. Hey, when you get a second, go check out Carolyn's Instagram feed and her website. I guarantee you will be inspired. I'll have links in the show notes to all things Carolyn Doling. You can just go to latebloomerliving.com forward slash podcast and look for episode 122. By the way, one way to stop feeling invisible is to surround yourself with a bunch of other rowdy women who are not going quietly into oblivion. Please consider this your official invitation to join the Midlife Uprising community and come to our monthly Zoom gatherings where we are shaking up the status quo and making waves. I know you're busy, but it's only one hour once a month and it's so much fun. Our next gathering is Tuesday, January 10th at 9 o'clock Eastern Time and you can find all the details at midlifeuprising.com. Thank you so much for listening. I hope you have a fantastic week. Stay safe and well. Talk soon.